My name is David Swanson. We are, in the next 75 minutes, going to try to outline what needs to change in the U.S. and global communications system to facilitate ending war. Some of this may apply to textbooks, movies, and a million other media, but we're going to be looking in particular at news reporting. In the book that you've all been given a global security system, an alternative to war, you will also find a section on peace journalism and on the myths that are embedded in the sort of journalism that can report that US troops are defending themselves against aggression by Syrian troops in Syria, or that Russia is attacking the United States in the Baltic Sea or that the very next humanitarian war is guaranteed to be the first one to benefit humanity. Journalism that probably accomplishes more by what it doesn't tell than by what it does tell. We have some wonderful speakers to assist us in this project today. Let's hear from each of them. First is Sam Husseini. Sam is the communications director of the Institute for Public Accuracy, which puts out timely information and promotes useful spokespeople to the media. IPA put out some of the most critical information regarding dubious claims on Iraq in 2002-2003. Sam has also asked top U.S. and foreign officials questions nobody else has dared and gotten himself suspended from the National Press Club, among other places. We're going to see if we can get him suspended from American <laughs> University. Um, it's really funny being here, actually, uh, because I got into this business because of a talk at American University. Thirty odd years ago, Chomsky gave a talk here that I got on, you know, that I taped VHS style um, uh, all, the, all those years ago and watched over, and he plugged the Media Watch Group Fair. I happened to be in New York at the time, and so I knocked on their door and ended up uh, getting into, into, this, uh, into this work. Um, during that talk, um, he got a question about how can we change the media to be more citizen controlled. And Chomsky gave a generalized answer that I've sort of spent a lot of years trying to formulate, and that is it's a chicken and egg thing. That is, can you actually reform the establishment media, and do you have to build new independent structures that are under meaningful citizen control? Um, and there are a whole litany of ways that that interplay happens, I think. One way. David alluded to, is getting media that asks tough questions. That sometimes happens through the major media. Uh, Matthew Lee, the State Department correspondent at uh, the State, uh, the, the AP correspondent at the State Department, occasionally asks good, tough questions, especially on Central America. And those of us who try to watch these issues try to toss some stuff, say, hey, you know, can you do that? And occasionally it happens, and I think we have to be more adept at using that, at using those individuals in major media. Uh, a lot of people who are doing independent media c came out of the major media. Bob Perry, who edits Consortium News, used to work at uh, Newsweek as well as the AP. So there are you know, opportunities there, and we need to exploit them as much as possible. But I think the emphasis is that we should be trying to build up meaningful citizen-controlled democratic media and I think we also have to be demanding of that media. Um, I, I think that um, outlets that people look to, whether that's Democracy Now! or The Intercept and so on, should be doing stuff like asking tough questions, getting into news conferences. And that's not happening uh, enough. Lee Fang uh, from uh, The Intercept occasionally asks tough questions um, uh, of various officials. Um, uh, Russell Mokhyber, a uh, corporate crime reporter, has done some of that, but it really needs to happen at a much, much higher level, um, I think. Um, I, I also want to emphasize the importance of the media. I think that we often end up talking about um, the media simply reflect power, and I don't think that's true, uh, or at least it certainly isn't always true. Um, George Bush, the first, when he got in, what was the rap on him, the media rap on George Bush, the first? He, yeah, he's wobbly. He's a wimp. You know, we, you know uh, when he was about, uh, after Saddam moved into Kuwait, uh, it, it was, you know, Thatcher got the sound bite. Don't go wobbly on us, George. Um, and so the, the media structure, the establishment sort of pushed him to be more militaristic. That certainly happened. In the case of Clinton, I feel bad with my notes over here. Let me hide my notes. That's <laughs> um, uh, the, um, uh, 
uh, so uh, Clinton bombed Iraq and continued the sanctions, but uh, was pushed into those positions often. Who here might remember, when Clinton first got into office, what was his position on Iraq? If Saddam Hussein wants a new relationship, I'm a Baptist, I believe in deathbed conversions, we can have a new relationship. Who came after him for that? Great liberal of the New York Times, Tom Friedman, went after him for that. Clinton immediately backtracked. His new incoming Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, said, I'm, I'm a Presbyterian. I don't know what Bill's talking about. Um, and Clinton backtracked, and they maintained the sanctions for the duration of Clinton's term, setting up the stage for uh, Bush II's ultimate, um, ultimate uh, invasion uh, of, of Iraq. Um, after the invasion of Iraq, uh, what was the media rap on George, on W? Don't cut and run. You got us into this war. Don't cut and run. Who said that? That was Kerry's position. Kerry's position in 2003, 2004 uh, was uh, don't, don't cut and run. I, I asked Kerry about that. I don't know if I have time, but I'll, I'll get into that as well. So I, I think we have to see how the media in ways subtle and bad um, uh, push the militarism. And we certainly see that vis-a-vis -vis Obama. Uh, you know, he backed out. He didn't bomb Syria. Uh, he's a pacifist, ignoring the militarism of the Obama administration. That's another manifestation uh, of it, I think. So we have to, I think, be hypercritical of that and the outright falsifications that we see. Um, I got NPR to actually issue a correction a couple of months ago. Well, you know, you, you, you'd have to do a ton of Googling to find it, but it was a really critical um, thing. It was right after the, it was during their coverage after the Orlando massacre. Um, and the discussion was, what's going to happen if there's more terrorist attacks building up to the election? And their counterterrorism correspondent um, said, uh, well, in Spain this happened, and they had a terrorist attack right before an election, and it helped the more conservative candidate. By her, their parlance, presumably meaning the more pro-war candidate. That is exactly the opposite of what happened in Spain. Uh, the uh, incumbent party in 2004, which dragged the Spanish population into uh, going along with the invasion of Iraq, um, uh, uh, was ahead in the polls. There was a bombing, the train, big train bombing, uh, that happened in Madrid in 2004. You might remember it. Um, and the critical thing was people went in, out into the streets. And their, their motto is similar to the motto right here of this conference. No to terrorism, no to war. They went out into the streets making that public demand and changed the milieu. There was a 10% swing in the polls in a matter of days. The incumbent party, pro-war party, ended up losing. The new party went in on the promise of getting out of Iraq in six months. They got out in five. There has not been a touch of Middle East-related terrorism in Spain since <laughs> then. <laughs> that that is a major critical story. NPR totally falsified it. I tweeted at the, at the reporter at the time, no response. Uh, I got fair to blog it. They extracted a correction from NPR, which was totally convoluted, totally <laughs> buried the lead of what happened. They put it on a web page somewhere that wasn't connected to their front page. They certainly didn't do anything on air and totally buried it, even though they got the story precisely wrong. How am I doing on time? <laughs> All right. Um, um, so um, I, I think that part of what we're seeing now, part of the other mantras are Trump washing. The, the, the entire establishment is sort of like, we are sane. He's the crazy one. Um, I, I mentioned Kerry before. Let me just very briefly highlight this. Um, oh, gosh, no, it didn't come up. Um, uh, uh, Kerry um, basically said, uh, I, I questioned him um, 
this was like 2008 or so, about his Iraq war vote. And he basically said, as soon, you know, you've, you voted for war. What, you know, what's up with that? Um, and he said, no, as soon as I voted for, as soon as Bush misused my vote and moved into Iraq, uh, I immediately objected. Um, and, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what didn't happen. Um, he, he stayed silent, as did a lot of people, and came up with the don't cut and run. That, 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 you know, I did extensive nexus searching. All I could find of him in 2003, late 2003, was don't cut and run. Um, so that's sort of a media fabrication. But you know, everybody's obsessing over Trump, obviously, pretending that he was against war when he said, yeah, I guess so, when he was on Howard Stern or whatever. But, 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 the over, but the maniacal emphasis on Trump sort of lets the rest of the establishment off the hook. It's very functional for them in a lot of ways. Um, one thing that I think really needs to happen is building up structures. Um, we set up uh, not too long ago a calendar for IPA, uh, a media calendar to get other media to use this, independent media. Um, uh, to, to, to build up structure. Does this look familiar to anybody? It's indie media. Indie media was doing this stuff when indie media, you know, came and rose, you know, 10 years ago. So we're, you know, we, we have these movements, Occupy and so on, and there's a kind of boom and bust cycle to them. And I think what we need is to build, you know, lasting institutions that help keep things going. And one of those things is... Um, uh, a calendar, for example. I think that there are tremendous opportunities now to be, um, you know, building up bases of knowledge of wikis that have the skinny on all of the establishment figures that could be presented in a graphical form, be utilized. You know, you sort of have this to some extent on Facebook with memes and so on, but something more substantial than that. I think that there are tremendous opportunities to be, you, you know, using those types of mechanisms to really be reaching a much greater mass audience. And the, the, the big elephant in the room for me is a live feed. Uh, we, we've continuously had these, um, uh, you know, Al Jazeera was the answer <laughs> for a lot of people several years ago. And of course, they're ultimately con controlled by the Qatari regime. They might do good work. There might be good people in there, just like there's good people at AP and ABC and so on. But ultimately, that's who's calling the shots. And ultimately, they are going to uh, scale back, as happened. You know, the Arab Spring, uh, I, I never adopted the term, the uprisings sort of got shoved into against the secular regimes that resulted in failed states, which was very functional for the US establishment. Um, and the monarchies are sitting pretty and further dominating the regimes. Uh, and they're very close to the U.S. establishment. And we have a situation now of failed states and perpetual war. That was somewhat predictable. Uh, David mentioned I got suspended from the press club. That's what I got suspended from the press club about. The Saudi ambassador was there in 2011, and he was all poo-pooing the Syrian regime. And my question was, what's your legitimacy? You know, <laughs> what's the legitimacy of the Saudi regime <laughs> uh, and for that? I got suspended, so I think we. <laughs> um, so I think we, you know, need to be um, very mindful about how things are being portrayed by various media and how media molds movements. I mean, if you're somebody who's fed up with the Syrian, the authoritarianism of the Assad regime, you might risk your life if you think the world is watching, right? Um, but you're not going to do it if you're, uh, you know, somebody who wants democracy in Saudi Arabia because nobody's watching. You're going to stay silent. So in effect, the media structure sort of casts a shadow uh, that way. Um, uh, how am I? You got two minutes left. Okay. Um, and. Um, um, what, what I've, um, I should just show the Accuracy webpage briefly if people aren't familiar. We put out what we hope are timely news releases. We've been plugging the conference this week, which I, I think was, was needed. We don't do that too often. Um, usually they're pegged to breaking news events and so on. Um, I, I should highlight um, a, a good deal of work 
um, uh, th that I've done a lot of other people is to build up Pacifica uh, over the years. And obviously it is, I, if people are watching it, it is very much on the decline. Democracy Now! is doing some good work and some things that I think can be improved. Um, uh, but, you know, that, 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 that is an institution that invented listener sponsorship. Um, the very notion that you pay for something that you don't need to pay for, that, that now NPR and a lot of other places on the web utilize, I think is a solution for the, the, the problem of, of the internet is how to raise money for something without constricting your content. And that still has an application here if it's done right. If there's a live stream that is compelling with you know, that shows news uh, conferences and debunks what's being said at the news conference on the lower third in real time and shows protests in different parts of the world in a timely, informative way, showing the listener uh, the, the critical information to explain what's being shown. There is a real opportunity to do that. The technology is there. Um, uh, if people are in D.C. and want to try to give new life for Pacifica, I think that that's a worthwhile effort. Another thing is here where WAMU is, and tons of other radio stations around the United States are owned by, their license is owned by a university. There are lots of people doing interesting work in universities that never get on the air uh, on public radio. A couple of dozen people downtown tied to the establishment at the NPR building determine the content that ends up being heard on all of these university radio stations. There may well be opportunities to try to revamp that, to reformulate that. There's no single bullet solution, but there are a lot of aspects that we can go at to, to, to try to meaningfully change the structure of, of the media for peace. Thank you, Sam. That was terrific. Uh, next up is Gareth Porter, one of our best independent investigative journalists on U.S. foreign policy. His latest book is Manufactured Crisis, the Untold Story of the Iran Nuclear Scare, published by Just World Books. Uh, Porter was Saigon Bureau Chief of Dispatch News Service International in 1971. Andrew Basevich calls his book Perils of Dominance, Imbalance of Power and the Road to War, published in 2005, quote, without a doubt the most important contribution to the history of U.S. national security policy to appear in the past decade. Porter has taught Southeast Asian politics and international studies here at American University with, as far as I know, no discernible impact on WAMU. Thanks so much, David. And uh, I especially want to thank David for giving me special dispensation to go a little bit, maybe far beyond, the boundaries of uh, the, the uh, apparent boundaries of this uh, topic. Um, I do want to give my one-minute uh, take on news media and what is to be done. Uh, but then I want to go on to something much larger, which uh, I, I think, you know, I, I have a, a, a message that is, is more uh, applicable to the rest of the conference. The, what, what I want to say very briefly about the, the media, and, and, and by the way, I think Sam Husseini has done wonderful work. Uh, I, I think he's in a class by himself in, and uh, and what he is doing needs to be done more uh, by more people uh, in, in support of the same kind of thrust. Uh, yeah. Having said that, I mean, I, you know, my, my take on the nature of the news media and the politics of war is that it is in the nature of corporate news media never if it can get away with it, to accept any uh, information or analysis or facts that conflict with the uh, official line of the national security state, unless that line happens to be to the left of their line, in which case, many times, as, as Sam has correctly pointed out, the news media have attacked the White House uh, and uh, administration policy if it was not 
uh, sufficiently hawkish for their liking. Uh, and so it, it is a very peculiar problem that um, I, I don't think we have adequately understood precisely why it, it is that way, undoubtedly multiple reasons. Um, but in my view, it, it is important to continue this work of following the media critically, pointing out when it strays from the truth, and getting it out in whatever way is most uh, uh, efficient and most effective. But in the, in the last analysis, it seems to me, we are going to make real progress in getting out the message uh, of an anti-war position, not through the corporate media at all, and, and this perhaps is too obvious to even say, but by uh, the, the anti-war movement itself uh, having its own system of communication which is most effective, which is, which is more effective because the message is well honed, it is at least relatively unified, and speaks to the consciousness of the audience that it's trying to reach. And so that I will use as a segue into the part of my presentation that I wanted to really talk about, and, and, uh, and, and David was kind enough to let me do this. I want to present to you uh, a vision of something that has not been, as far as I know, discussed seriously for quite a while. A national strategy to mobilize a very large segment of the population of this country to participate in a movement to force the retreat of the permanent war state. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, now, now, what I've written here, what I'm going to read to you is, I know that many of you must be thinking, that is a great idea for 1970 or 1975, but no longer relevant to the realities that we face in today's society. Uh, and it's true that this idea, uh, at, at first thought, seems to harken back to the days of the Vietnam War when anti-war sentiment was so strong that even Congress and the news media were powerfully influenced by it. And we can all, not all of us, but many of us, shall we say, can think back uh, to, to when that was true. Uh, we all know what has transpired over the decades since then to make what I call the permanent war state the new normal, as, as Andrew Bacevich has so well put it. Let me tick off five of the reasons uh, that I know are obvious to all of you, but just to remind us of the situation that we face. First, the draft uh, was replaced by a professional army, taking away the dominant factor in the surge of anti-war sentiment during the Vietnam era, or at least initially the dominant factor. Second, the political parties in Congress have been taken over completely and corrupted by the military-industrial complex and other uh, powerful uh, interest groups. Third, the war state exploited the 9-11 uh, attacks to accumulate new enormous powers and appropriate far more of the federal budget than ever before. Fourth, the news media are more warlike than ever before, I think it's fair to say. Um, we can argue that point, and, and that may not be as clear as the other points. Fifth, and, and I think in some ways this could be the most important of all, the powerful anti-war uh, movement that was mobilized in this country uh, and around the world in response to the U.S. invasion of Iraq was demobilized over a few years by Bush and even more so by Obama because of the inability of activists to have any impact on either, on the policy of either administration. And I've talked to enough activists over the years to understand the process by which this happened. They uh, saw that what they had been doing was making no difference, and they drifted away from the issue of war and peace into local issues, housing, race relations, and so forth. And, and this, therefore, is a problem of disempowerment, which we have to overcome. 
So you can all probably add more points to this litany of, uh, of the problems that beset, that have beset uh, the anti-war movement such as it is in this country over the past few decades, uh, which make the landscape, the anti-war uh, activism landscape, seem so bleak uh, to many people. I think it's pretty obvious that the permanent war state has achieved what Gramsci called ideological hegemony. Or is it hegemony? I'm not sure. I, I call it hegemony. Um, and to such a degree that the first real expression of radical politics in generations, that is the Sanders campaign, was not willing or able to make that an issue uh, in any important way during the campaign. Nevertheless, I'm here to suggest to you that despite the fact that the war state, with all its private allies, appears to be riding as high as ever, the historical circumstances are now uh, perhaps more favorable to a frontal challenge to the war state than in many, many years. And, and I would cite three major uh, fundamental reasons why uh, this is the case. First, the Sanders campaign showed that a very large proportion, particularly of the millennial generations, do not trust those who hold power in the society because they understand that the, the, the powerful elites in the society have rigged uh, economic and social arrangements to benefit a tiny minority while screwing over the vast majority, and particularly that, uh, th those generations of the young. Now, obviously, the permanent state, the, the operations of the permanent state can be convincingly analyzed as fitting precisely that model. And that, in my view, and I'm hoping to have some discussion of this, that opens up a new opportunity to take on the permanent war state. Second, US military interventions in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere have been such obvious, disastrous failures that the present historical juncture is marked by a low point in support for interventionism reminiscent of the late Vietnam War period and the post-war period. That is the late 1960s to the early 1980s. Most Americans turned against Iraq and Afghanistan just about as fast as they did against the Vietnam War. And this phenomenon, this, this new degree of of opposition to continuation of any U.S. military intervention uh, was, made itself felt in, 2013, in 2013 when Barack Obama had announced that he was going to go to war in Syria. He was going to use military force against the Assad regime in Syria. Um, and even in the face of overwhelming media coverage that encouraged that support, a Gallup poll in September 2013 showed that the level of support for the proposed use of force in Syria, 36%, was lower than for any of the five wars that had been proposed by the United States since the end of the Cold War. So, so we are here at a, at a stage of evolution of public opinion, which naturally has lost its taste for military intervention. Now, of course, that is far more true of big wars with ground forces than it is for drones. That's a problem. We have to face that. That's, that's clear. But nevertheless, this is an opening that needs to be exploited. Third, and, and this, I think, could be, in a sense, even more important than the other two, the very obvious bankruptcy of the two-party system in this election, of both the parties, Amen. has made and will continue to make tens of millions of people in this country, especially young people, blacks, independents, open to a movement that connects the dots in the way that they need to be connected. So what, um, what I want to suggest is that with these favorable strategic conditions, as I've laid them out, in mind, it is time for a newly invigorated national movement to come together around a concrete strategy for accomplishing the goal which may 
have seemed impossible up to now of ending the permanent war state. And, and what I mean by that is to take away the means by which the permanent war state can carry out its intervention in foreign conflicts. What would that mean? Uh, I would like to cite the following four key elements of a strategy that, uh, that I'm suggesting needs to be thought, thought about, needs to be discussed, needs to be uh, raised to the level of a national uh, discussion. First, a clear, concrete vision of what eliminating the permanent war state would mean in practice is needed to provide a meaningful target for people to support. That hasn't been done yet. I know there's been a lot of work done on cutting military budget, opposing a lot of, uh, of, of themes, a lot of fu functions in the military budget. But I, I still think that we could produce a, a vision of ending the permanent war state that would go beyond uh, many of the useful work that's been done already and would provide that target, which is so important to mobilize people. Secondly, a new and compelling way of educating and mobilizing people to action against the permanent war state. And, and by that, I mean uh, basically a, uh, a new way or, or a refined way of communicating the message that the national security state, the, the organs of national security of this country and their, and their operations really have no legitimacy. We need to delegitimize them. And I want to talk a little bit about that if I have a, a couple minutes left over at the end of this. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thirdly, we need a strategy for reaching specific segments of the society on this issue. We need to focus on those uh, parts of the society which we have good reason to believe are open to this message. We need to have a strategy that focuses communications and organizing on campuses, on, on places and organizations where we can reach youth, young people, the millennials, um, and obviously linking up with those organizations that have flourished over the last few years around social justice are, need, need to be part of this strategy. And fourthly, we need a plan for bringing political pressure to bear with the aim of ending the permanent war state within a relatively short period of years. And folks, I want to tell you that one thing that I've decided is that I want to do this before I die. <laughs> Now, I don't know how many years I have left, but I want to make sure that we do this before I kick the bucket. All right. All right. So <laughs> now, now I, I have a few minutes left, so I want to talk just for, for a few minutes about uh, what, what I think would be the most useful approach to shaping a campaign message on the importance of ending the permanent war state. Uh, and again, I, I come back to the Sanders campaign as the experience that gave me hope that there was a way here, a new way to communicate the message. Because we know that the Sanders campaign appealed to a widespread sense that the political and economic systems had been rigged, as I said, in favor of the super rich. We need to make a parallel in regard a parallel to that rigged system in the financial and economic policy systems to the permanent war state. Now, how do we do that? Such an appeal would characterize the entire system that makes and implements U.S. war policies as a racket. To put it another way, the permanent war state, the state institutions and individuals who push for policies and programs to carry out perpetual war, must be delegitimized de in the same way that those financial elites dominating the economy have been delegitimized for a large segment of the U.S. population already. The campaign should exploit the potent parallel between Wall Street and national, the national security state in terms of siphoning off trillions of dollars, not billions, not hundreds of billions, but trillions of dollars uh, from the American people. 
For Wall Street, the ill-gotten gains took the form of excessive profits from a rigged economy. For the national security state its, and its contractor allies, who are, in fact, part of that state, that took the form of seizing control over money appropriated from the U.S. taxpayers to enhance their personal and institutional power. Uh, and by the way, I, I want to just add, when I use the term power, this is a key concept that, I have to say it this way, the left has never really gotten. The left is, ex is exceptionally attracted to the idea that the only issue that is a problem, the only problem really underlying U.S. imperialism is corporate profits. Well, that is a problem, no doubt about it. But we have to come to grips with the fact that we have some of the, not some of the, we have the most powerful bureaucratic organizations the world has ever known at work here. And they have continued to appropriate more, not just money, but power. And power is important to these people. Power means to them that they can do whatever they want. It means that they have more to do it with. It means that they can affect more people. And, and if you want to understand this, think about the National Security Agency. Now, you know, we, we have finally, from within the NSA, we have testimony from people who were at relatively high levels. Tom Drake was a senior official of the NSA, and he's come out. And Tom Drake understands, and I've talked to him about this at length, he understands that the motivation of these people at the top of the NSA was power. They wanted everything. They wanted to scoop up all information for its own sake. And that's a problem that is matched in all of the organs of the national security state, the Pentagon, the, arms, the, the, the uniformed armed services, the CIA, the State Department, and the National Security Council, and those people in the White House who, who can use US military power as a political ploy or as a political toy for their own power. So these are all part of the problem that we have to bring into to the message. Um, so, in conclusion, we need to update General Smedley Butler's memorable slogan, wonderful slogan from the 1930s, War is a Racket, <laughs> to reflect the benefits that now accrue to the national security establishment uh, that, that make those war profiteers of the 1930s seem like child's play. Uh, I suggest the slogan something like, permanent war is a racket, or the war state is a racket, or both. Why not use both? So, so this is the kind of approach that I think I would like to have discussed. And, and you know, if people see uh, problems with this, this is a good time. This is the first time I've presented this publicly. I would love to have your comments, your reactions to the whole idea. Uh, and, and so I guess that's where I'll leave it right there. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, we will next hear from Christopher Simpson. He's a professor of journalism here at American University, but known internationally for his expertise in propaganda, democracy, and media theory and practice. He has won national awards for investigative reporting, historical writing, and literature. His books include Blowback and The Splendid Blonde Beast and many others. Welcome, Christopher Simpson. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, especially on this panel with Sam and, and Garrett. Well, Sam was talking about really the sort of day-to-day -day struggle of getting peace news, or at least um, contrary news or opposition news, into mainstream media. And Garrett was talking about a broader picture of, first of all, the importance of media as an arena of struggle and ways to address that that uh, make some strategic uh, sense. I'm going to look at something different, and that has to do with why is it that, here's Stephen Biko, I'm sure you've, you've heard of him or you know of him. The mo he said, this is in the context of the, of the South African struggle, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Why is that? Why is that? 
Why is it that people will accept or at least tolerate oppression and even internalize it? So that's what I'm going to talk about, or at least try to. Uh, let's see. All right. Here's the four main ideas. Propaganda is pervasive, and it's shaped. Second, prop information operations at home and abroad are integral to media operations these days. It's not a sideshow. Okay, next, mass media remains an important arena for struggle, which, uh, you know, Gareth and, and Sam and I have known each other for a while, but we, we didn't consult on these, these presentations, and yet it seems to have become a, a part of all three of them. I put my address here, it's because I'm not going to read these slides, uh, because that would be hopelessly boring. Um, but if you would like copies of them, send an email to me with your email on it, and I will send you a copy of the, of the PowerPoints. Okay. There's a paradox in the United States, in our culture, and it's, it's our origin stories lay claim to democracy, freedom, freedom of speech, justice under law, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, the actual history of the country has been frequently quite different. Um, the main points here I'm sure you're aware of. Um, I would add to Gareth's points that one of the things that we're experiencing right now is a deep crisis of legitimacy for ruling elites in the United States. This is on both sides of the, of the mainstream aisle. Uh, we're also experiencing a deepening economic crisis which has as its results the, what is called the hollowing out of the middle class and working class. Uh, and uh, we appear to be, in terms of technological um, um, events, the, um, facing an enormous loss of jobs for people in this country and in other parts of the world as well. But there are some upsides to this, and that is the victories that people in our country have uh, won over the years to protect human rights, civil rights, their own rights, independence, and freedom of thought. So I'm not going to read this, but I would like to point out something that we haven't really discussed very much so far today, and that is the role of educational systems in reinforcing the main propaganda or ideological lines, if you will, um, of today's myths. And one of those is that you have masters and servants in society. And if you want to be a master, you have to go to college. And that having completed that, that you will at least have a shot at reaching that status. And there's several messages uh, uh, embedded in that. One is, is that the masters have virtue, that they are masters as a result of their virtue or their brains or their hard work, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also, it, it suggests that, the, that there's a great deal of social mobility in the United States. And it is true that there is some social mobility in the United States. It is less social mobility than almost any other industrial country in the world. And it has gotten much more difficult to rise in the social ladder during the past 15 years. All right. During the 1990s, or, yeah, 1990s, there was a professionalization of public relations, marketing, and propaganda. It became much more sophisticated than previously, a larger economic force, and uh, routinized. It became an ordinary part of what um, corporations, politicians, even low-level politicians, used to pursue their goals. And as, as some of you will remember the Ging Gingrich campaign strategy for Republicans. This is the conception that you accuse your political opponents of being evil. And this is what underpins much of the Republican Party's strategy up to the present day. Clinton's, uh, uh, Bill Clinton in that particular case uh, articulated some new democratic strategies. 
<laughs> All right, one last thing I want to point out here is propaganda and surveillance became integrated. And I don't mean ethnically. I mean that they are two sides of a single coin. And that typically had been more separated previously into different specialist groups. Now, when a candidate, a company, an advocate of one sort or another pursues or develops a strategic communication policy, surveillance of its audience, the ones they're trying to reach, is tightly entwined with the propaganda strategy itself, the content. And you see it in the, in the presidential elections. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about information operations, which is simply Pentagon talk for propaganda operations. It's viewed as a force multiplier. And as such, it has become a profit center, if you will, for public relations community and so on. Um, the, and we, we know quite a bit about how these information operations work. It's because there's been leaks, there's been declassified information, and so forth. Another thing that we know about it is that because we're in a more globalized media environment, that means that messages that were intended, let us say, for the Afghan public will also reach the American public and vice versa. And what that means, in turn, is two things. One is that we have more data about the on-the-ground situation in conflict zones than has previously been possible. And the second thing that that means is that there's a bureaucratic struggle within the government over whose turf it's going to be. Is it going to be the State Department's version of what we're doing in Afghanistan? Or is it going to be the Defense Department version of what we're doing in Afghanistan? And they're not the same. Is it going to be USAID's version of what we're doing in Afghanistan? They're not the same. And in fact, they rather often conflict with each other. This is uh, Department of Defense strategic communication planning uh, in about 2007. And um, it's, a, it's a declassified uh, graphic here. Let me stand over here. This is an early version. And you, you can see that it's a Department of Defense working hard. Uh, and, but what they, in, in fairness, what they have done is to try to break down the whole of culture and the whole of communication patterns and to chart it out in such a way that they can enter into it and make use of it to pursue their goals. And this, in this particular case, is basically uh, discussing Iraq and Afghanistan, but they've tried to do a generic setup of you have your host government, you have the infrastructure in that country, you have opinion leaders in the country and so forth, then you have the, the coalition's capacities and its priorities, the extent of domestic support for the coalition, and so forth and so on. So they've tried, not entirely successfully, but nevertheless, this is the, this is the goal that they were seeking in putting together communication strategy for their, for their operation. <coughs> this continues it. Here you see a basic, uh, it's really quite a simple uh, structure that, that says, well, We've got different types of audiences. We've got different types of resources. So here is how we're going to try to put it together in a systematic sense. All right. Here you see it more elaborate. And here what you have, again, is what you see more clearly here is that they, con they, they conceptualize this as uh, different types of activities and the dimensions in which those activities are carried out. Physical, 
is Department of Defense speak for military, for war, for guns, for physical action, sometimes called kinetic. Those of you who follow this stuff will be familiar with that. Um, And this one is a more concise thing. But what is interesting about this one in particular is that you see, if you look under physical domain, that is on the uh, right-hand side of this uh, presentation, that striking, maneuvering, protecting, which are traditional military roles, are viewed as integrated with the information operations. So here's the, the uh, Department of Defense doctrine for 2014. It's not classified. I'd be happy to send you a copy of it. But the, the point is, is that by, you know, kind of the, the curiosity of history in the United States in our time is that we have good information about the thinking of the people who are making decisions about these types of operations. So now we turn to coping with mass media. I agree with much of what, what uh, Sam said. You have to cope with mass media. Mass media is not our friend. <laughs> Never has been. Not really. There's, there's been passages where people have done good things, or good reporters, so forth and so on. But as an institution, it has never been friendly to uh, the peace movement or, or any other movement. So that puts us into a funny spot. It's a, and this is a philosophical question. Is the way, and this, this goes to, to Garris' uh, uh, proposal. That is, do we attempt to transcend propaganda, to move beyond it, to move more deeply, to move somehow more truthfully? Or do we engage in propaganda in order to reach the same audiences that the mainstream media reaches? And it's a complex question. There's a lot of different layers to it. But here's some ideas. Watch the frames on stories. Framing is a communication technique in, in which Corporations do it uh, very well. There's a particular story. There's a particular crisis. The company has particular interests there. They will define their public message in such a way that it is framed so that what they have to say is uh, the focus point, the focal point, right? And the stuff that is problematic for them is not touched. It is left out. Now, theoretically, reporters should have the job of knowing what's outside of the frame and bringing that into the story. But as a practical matter, that is frequently not the case. And we can discuss the reasons for that. But as activists, as peace activists, what you do is you watch these media frames to see what has been left out. You identify the frame and you surface it. You bring it to public attention. And I, fr I think, frankly, that, that that is a big part of what, what, uh, uh, what Sam has done and done it very well. OK. Uh, you identify the unspoken assumptions of media narratives. Now, one of the things, how much time do I have, please? You're good. <laughs> OK, all right. Okay, all right, that'll work. Um, content of media is or are narratives. They are little stories. So you can think of them as fables or as parables. They have little plots that, in which good guys prevail over bad guys or bad guys prevail over good guys. You have, you have identified interest groups in the little stories. And you, if you talk to reporters, you'll know that sometimes a reporter will say, oh, that, wrote, that story wrote itself, <laughs> right? Why? 
<laughs> it's because it followed a narrative that was quite simple to reproduce. <coughs> All right. So what you do is you understand that reality about mainstream media, and media generally, and you surface it. You bring it to public attention to show, as, as Sam was talking about, that the assumption of NPR concerning the Spanish events was actually, uh, it wrote itself in the mind of that reporter. If you do, do you see what I'm saying there? Okay. Um, and finally, here's, here's something really basic when it comes to television, the cursed medium, um, and that is pictures. Pictures. If you don't have pictures, you will not be on television. You can start with that assumption. Uh, so that if you, if you want to uh, access uh, that audience or that medium, you have to deal with what it views as its professional standards. All right, this is basically a, uh, uh, a wrap-up. Um, what I would say here... And this also goes to, to um, uh, Garris' proposal, is that humor, satire, daringness, those help to crack the media bubble. Not automatically, but those are powerful tools in coping with mass media. So use it. Um, <laughs> All right, and then and the last thing is, is I think that part of the campaign to be active in the media arena has to be a, a direct and powerful critique of the arena itself, of the assumptions and of the techniques that media organizations bring to trying to explain the world to their audiences. Uh, that's all for now.